We made it. This is round two because <laughs> I was in my basement because the dogs are barking. We have cleaners here and uh, the Wi-Fi was too glitchy. So I moved up to my office. So guys, you could hear young children in the background. You could hear dogs barking. You could hear a vacuum. This is a very exciting <laughs> chat. Real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. You messaged me. First of all, okay, tell everybody where you are. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. So we were chatting about the weather and I went, ah, there was a blizzard here yesterday. <laughs> Which is wild to me. So we have had like not normal weather either because it's November 3rd and today is 20 degrees and sunny outside. Oh man, I went to university in Ottawa. So I'm always jealous of the fact that your winter is just that much you know, not quite as long. Yeah. We were just like, woohoo, we made it through Halloween without snow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Literally. Um, on Halloween, just on Monday, it was raining, which is weird. You and it wasn't cold. So that's fine. I was like, I would rather have the mist, you know, from the sky than it be cold. Cause yeah, we were a little bit damp, but that's okay. You're you're moving. It's warm. There's candy. I know. everyone's good. If we were all distracted, what university were you at in Ottawa? I went to Carleton. Oh. I graduated in 07. I'm aging myself. 07. <laughs> so I was at Carleton starting in what? 08. Oh my gosh, we just missed each other. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So I went there for my master's and then I switched over to Ottawa U for my PhD. Whoa. So I was in Ottawa forever. Did Are you from Edmonton, then went there for school yep. and then went back? From Edmonton, yep. From Edmonton, wanted to go to school to be a journalist. So I was like, Carlton it is. And so I lived there while I was in school and then ca- traveled all over the world. But Edmonton has always been home and is now where I'm settled. So it's great. Yeah. So how long have you been living in Edmonton now? Uh, well, when I graduated in 07, did a bunch of traveling, but in between always came back to Edmonton. So really back since, I guess, 07, 08. Oh, okay. But even with the traveling, like it would be six months at a time, and then I come back for a few months and then go and then come back. So, what are some places that you travel to? I'm always curious because I feel like I've been to lots of places and people just like traveling for conferences and stuff. And I'm always well, interested. My first, my first overseas was through Carlton at the time and it was to Rwanda. Talk about the deep end. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, I was there. I, I'm primarily after that was Southeast Asia. Um, so like Thailand, Philippines, uh, Hong Kong, and then I also did some travel in Europe and like Switzerland and Germany and UK. Oh, nice. See, we were just yeah. talking, I was, my mother-in-law was just here and my husband's cousin lives in Switzerland with his wife and, um, their daughter actually lives in Toronto, but we were talking about going to Switzerland for Christmas, maybe next year. Uh, it is gorgeous with like the snow and the Alps, you got to take the train through the country and you'll just die because it's like, Oh, this is so beautiful. I can't believe it's real. They were talking about like a cheese market and taking like a whole, like being on the back of horses with on like a carriage, like through a park and stuff. I was like, what? Like I would love to go there. So yeah, if we did go, it would be, I would try and find a really nice Airbnb where we could all like have our own bedroom and be comfortable and enjoy. Yeah. Traveling. Um, I was never a skier, but I know people who've skied. And so you have to do that while you're there. If you ski, I just, I just skied a bit. Yeah. (laughs) Is there a place that you would want to go back to that you just loved? Philippines for sure. Yeah. Um, I just, I spent a lot of time there. I made a film while I was there and just got to know the people really well. And um, just like wonderful, most friendly people and it's fun and the culture is interesting and the food's amazing and the mangoes, yeah. gotta try the mangoes. Yeah. I can uh, never eat a mango now because I'm like, nope, doesn't get it. <laughs> right. Like that yeah. literally happens when you travel when, so we lived in Victoria, BC for like a year and some. And so the seafood and like, if you order mussels, 
at a restaurant or my husband likes oysters. It's like they literally just came from down the street. Right over there. Yeah. So now like in Toronto, I'm like, there's mussels on a menu. And I'm like, yeah, but how did they get here? I'm just going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I'm always kind of like, uh. Uh, anyways, so when you got back to Edmonton, when did you have your children? You said you have a five and a three-year-old. I do. So I had my first child in 2017. So okay. in my twenties, did a bunch of travel, you know, lived an adventurous life. And then eventually went like, I'm tired. <laughs> I, I worked in journalism for quite a while. And like most many journalists, um, you realize, Hmm, I'm not sure if this is worth the low pay and high stress um that I'm going through and I just realized like all the things I loved about journalism the storytelling and the meeting people like you didn't really get to do as much of that as you thought yeah so I left that industry as a while after a while and tried a few different um types of jobs uh you know did a little bit of sort of not mainstream television and then when I'm done worked in education for a little while like a group that works in the school system for you know the patrollers with the stop signs you know mm -hmm. I was a coordinator for one of those programs and then I met my husband and long story short, we had a family. Uh, in 2017, I had my first son. And then in 2019, I had my second son. Nice. And what do you remember? Is there anything that sticks out after you had your first son? Just about like what you thought about motherhood and postpartum um, and the recovery? Like, were you like, what? It was, it was a lot because my first was colicky for the first two months. Ooh, I was not prepared for that. It was just a lot of crying. And I just, no matter what I did, he would not stop crying. So how, like what's the, you always hear about babies being colicky and Milo was a pretty chill baby and him crying would always like just cause so much anxiety. Like, yes. Yes. Like, yep. Yep. Yes. I feel it. Like <laughs> just the, the anxiety. Like, I can't do it. I can't stop you from crying. Yeah. And that is the reaction. Like, the internal reaction is like, I just need this to stop right now. Like, I have to do something to stop this. Like, I have to make it better. So, I'm like, that has to be biological. Yes. Right? That instinct. It has to be because it's instant. And nobody had to teach me that. Yes. And you know what I found funny? When I would go to like Toys R Us or wherever we were and somebody else's baby would cry, I'm like, I don't give two shits like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have that same level like now that my kids are out of the baby phase and i have friends who are having babies like i'm like give me a baby no problem whereas like before i hear a baby cry and i'm like ah, yeah. Mine. like yeah. It's just, yeah totally i guess because when it's yours it's like it's your responsibility to do something about it but yeah. Yeah. When it's somebody else's, you're like, oh, they're fine. Like, they'll be fine. But like with comparing my first to my second, like my second, I went, oh, maybe it's just because we're more chill. Yeah. And then we went, no, wait a minute. We just looked at it objectively and went, no, he's more chill too. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like night and day in terms of the newborn phase. So I felt like with my second, I got to sort of savor it a little more because with my first, I was in like survival mode, being a new mom and like a nonstop crying baby because he had reflux, which made him colicky. And then with the second, like I knew what I was doing a bit more. He didn't cry as much. It was less emotionally taxing, mm. but more physically demanding because I yeah. had two even after now, right? Yeah. So they're two years apart. Yeah. Okay. And so how do you find their relationship or like, what is it like now being three and five? Cause Milo's four. So yeah. I kind of have an idea of what the, f well, I guess he's right in between them. Yeah, so right do they get along? Do they play? And it's so cute. It was about, I'd say six months to a year ago that they started, like I called them pockets, like little pockets of play, like a few minutes here and a few minutes there where they wouldn't be like screaming and hitting each other. Um, and I'm, oh, they're playing, right? Um, and it's really been cool the past year or so to see their bond develop. Sure, they definitely fight. Like my second is very physical and my first is very highly sensitive. And so that can blow up quite quickly. But they also can go like really long periods now sometimes where they play and they chat and they, they laugh at how they're different. Like you'll go, Oh, Ethan, you're so funny. And Ethan will go, hi, Bob. He goes, his brother, hi, Bob. And when they're in new environments, like we're going somewhere new or different or someone's house, I notice they stick together. Like yeah. in a new environment, 
Whereas at home, they're comfortable and they're like, get out of my face, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's neat to know that they are bonding. It takes time like anything else, but it is really cool to like watch it unfold. Yeah, I love that. So when I put up the, you know, what do people want to talk about? You put in homeschooling. And <laughs> I remember like maybe a month ago, I was just scrolling TikTok and I came across this account and she's all about homeschooling. And she had this really long video about why she believes in homeschooling and, you know, just things about the school system. And she's American, but I I assume it's fairly similar. And I just found it so fascinating. And I I think I followed her and I like screenshot her thing because I was like, I would love to talk to her because I, it is very interesting. And having been in like schools my entire life till literally a few years ago. I have a lot of thoughts about the education system, especially higher education. Yeah. But what was the trajectory for you? Like have has the five-year-old never been in a traditional school? How did you make that decision? Like what prompted that? He has been, he went to play school because during the pandemic, I, it was like my only option to like have a little bit of a break between the two of them. So he went to play school. And also I feel like play school is very different than like once you get up to elementary in terms yeah. of structure. And, you know, it's very play-based when you're, when you're that young, but this would have been the year he would have gone off to kindergarten, like at the school down the street. Right. So we've chosen to homeschool for now, but it's always, you know, I grew up, I went to school. I love school. I was teacher's pet, that whole thing. But I just, you know, when I went to school for journalism and worked that while for worked that circuit for a while and realized I didn't want to do it anymore. I thought to my, the first thing I thought was like, Oh, I wish I went to school to be a teacher. Um, Cause I've always loved being around kids and I've loved teaching kids. And so this is, and, and I worked in that realm for a while with the school patrol program. And so it's always been in the back of my head, like the whole idea of educating kids um, and then when I had my own son and I, th- I had friends who I'd met that had homeschooled. And so it was just always in the radar, like, Oh, maybe I would do that. Nah, <laughs> right. Like too much work. I didn't yeah. Um, but then as my son got older and things got a little easier. And then as I started doing, like I do freelance work and my life is quite flexible and I just saw like, I could do this. Um, and with the resources that are available to us that weren't available with homeschooling 20, 30 years ago. And I also read some books, like a book called Free to Learn by Peter Gray, talking about child development and learning through play. And I just went, you know, philosophically, this really aligns with my goals. Like they're only this young once. Mm -hmm. And if I can make it work to be with my son and be alongside him during his education, why wouldn't I at least try and see how other people do it? It can be done. I've seen it done. And with social media, we see how practically it is done. And it just sort of like empowered me to be like, I want to give this a shot. I want to be involved with my kids education. And I want to be able to provide a really customized educational experience for him and his interests and his skill set, and which isn't always a possibility in the school system. I'm not going to knock on teachers. They're doing their best. Uh-huh. When you got 40 kids in a classroom, like you can't give that individualized level of education. No. And I just had a conversation. I don't even know if it was today because I talk so much, but it was about the healthcare, like home birth versus through the hospital. And it's like, it's not a knock against doctors and nurses. It's the system. And it's the same with the education. And I always think kids learn so differently and their interests are like so different from child to child. And how our education system is set up, it's like, it's one, it's one way and that's it. And there's no... Like there's no going yeah. out of that like one way. Yeah, so, exactly. Because like when you've got 40 kids, you can't. You, no. One or even two teachers can't do that. They can't provide an individualized level of education or customized to their learning style. You you, you know, they do their best. Uh, but So what does a day for you look like? Well, kindergarten is pretty... Chill. Relax, but <laughs> yeah, it's pretty chill. Uh, in the sense that you know, we sort of ease into our day. Um, you know, in the morning, I will tell him like, "Let's go get 
hit your breakfast. So he has a little cereal dispenser. He dispenses his own breakfast, which is not for me. I let him watch a little bit of shows in the morning and then we turn it off. We get dressed, we make the bed, which I feel like is learning you know, responsibility, right? Yeah ready for the day beyond that it's just a lot of providing diverse play opportunities whether that be you know we're going to build with magnetic tiles because he loves to build he's got like a builder brain so i'll say like let's build a car and then one time we were exploring sort of 3d shapes so i'm like this is called a cube because it's not just a flat square it's got different sides it makes your car you know i just kind of try to look at the world and educate him that way um, I've struggled with the whole, like how formal or informal should I make it at kindergarten? And, you know, you reach a point where you're like, I think I'm thinking too hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's in kindergarten, right? Right now, the idea is sparking the joy of learning. Mm-hmm. Um, so that as he gets older, we can explore that. And he doesn't see learning as like a burden. Um, we are using a program called reading eggs, which we love. Mm-hmm. He is now as a result of, he, we do that about probably half an hour a day um, and it's literacy and phonics. And from there, as we're reading books together, you know, he's starting to like sound out words a little bit with me. He also loves math. So we do a lot of counting like, hey, can you count out six apple slices for me or, or what have you? And so, you know, a lot of that sort of on the fly learning and just going with what his interests are, like in the homeschooling world, they call it like child directed learning, Mm -hmm. which is really easy to do. Like at this age, And what I've always done as a stay at home mom, you know, look at his interests, provide opportunities and see where it goes. So it's quite simple now. I know that might change as he gets older, but that's what I find kind of funny is people will be like, oh, what are you going to do when he has to learn chemistry? And I'm like, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a learning process for everybody, really. So yeah. if somebody's listening to this and they're like interested in exploring homeschooling, is there like a website that you go to and you're like, I want to homeschool my child? Like, do you have to register them somewhere? Do you get materials to like work through? Yeah. So kindergarten, at least here in Alberta, kindergarten is actually not technically mandatory. Um, so, but once they hit once they hit grade one, you register with a board, a school board. It doesn't have to be in your neighborhood. It can be in a different part of the city that um, facilitates homeschooling and you get a facilitator assigned to you. And twice a year, uh, it's different in each sort of locale, whether you're in a different province or different country. But here you get a facilitator visits your home twice a year to help you create a plan for your child. And different boards offer sort of different philosophies and so on. So starting in next year, we'll have a facilitator sort of assist, provide resources, point us in the right direction, which will be really nice to have that support. Um, beyond that, I've just, I've read a lot of books. I like, there's so many homeschooling organizations, uh, like Alberta Homeschooling here. There's Instagram pages I follow. Uh, there's so many resources out there. Highly recommend the book Free to Learn from like a philosophical perspective by Peter Gray. Um, but so many local libraries just have homeschooling resources, books on how to do it, different ways to do it. I've put together documents from friends who've been interested in it, being like, read this, read this, read that. There's a long list. <laughs> um, but yeah, just even a simple Google, especially post pandemic, there's so many different resources out there. Is there something that you do or are you mindful of making sure that he has social interaction like i know today you said you did like a field trip yeah yeah so this morning we spent two hours at an indoor skate park (laughs) they were on their scooters and everything there is uh that's honestly i have a facebook page and that's like the only reason i'm on it is to be a part of those homeschooling facebook groups uh they'll arrange sort of group discounted field trips to different locales uh, yeah, which is great because it's cheaper. I mean, when you're homeschooling, right, you're typically probably not working full time. So budgets are tight. And uh, yeah, so you get a group discount. There's probably 40 of us there. And so there's that socialization. He's got a couple buddies there that he's starting to connect with. And that's definitely the thing that does take a little bit more thought because when you go to a traditional school, there's like a built in social network. Mm hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at right now is is finding my little social network and Gabriel's social network, getting it started. You know, he's introverted. So he's really good with like one or two friends at a time. Um, so we go to a field trip probably about once a week, once every two weeks, maybe. Beyond that, you know, he's got a sibling for some level of socialization. And then like a cousin we see often. And then like church on Sunday, he's got a group of kids that we see every week in Sunday school. So I'm like, okay, hey, we'll start there. 
Yeah. Um, but I've also looked at as he gets older, starting a co-op where like once a week, there's the same group of people that like meets and maybe all of us parents pitch in and like pay for either maybe a teacher if they get older and we're like, oh, they need some help. <laughs> the has, whole he idea ever, has he ever asked you like, is he aware that other children go to school? And I imagine like when you watch even like kids TV shows, like school is such a thing that is in every like on tv in movies his friends maybe in the neighborhood go to school he yeah. sees the school bus like does he ask about that you know it's so funny because he went to play school like for two years one year twice a week second year three times a week and he was always good when we got there he was fine but he always was like i don't want to go he's just like social nervousness a little mm-hmm. bit uh, but it was always fine when he was there. And when I, when we were toying with whether or not to homeschool, we literally lived down the street from two public schools. You know, he goes to the playground there, he sees the kids, um, and he pop and will play with them. And when we were toying with it, he was like, you mean I don't have to go to that school with all those kids? There's so many. I was like, well, maybe it's an option. And he was like, yes, yes, I want to homeschool. <laughs> he just big crowds freak him out. Yeah. Uh, and then Interestingly enough, he sees his little brother go to the same play school he did twice a week. He loves his teachers, but he has expressed nothing of missing play school. He has never expressed wanting to go to school. Uh, he he understands we're doing homeschooling, and so we do our education at home. Um, he doesn't think like, oh, I don't have to learn. But like, um, yeah, it's weird. I think because he's introverted, so I do push him on that aspect socially. That's something I'm very cognizant of. But yeah, weirdly enough with him, because he is introverted and, and easily overwhelmed in larger groups, yeah, he is expressed here. My second son might be different because he's way more extroverted. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> and they could be completely different, like different interests, different. Yep. Yeah. I know. Which it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see. And I'm an extrovert. So it's it's strange for me raising an introvert because I'm like, go, go. But I'm like, I don't want to push him too hard. But at the same time. You know, I, I want to build that resilience for him. To that's mm-hmm. why I think homeschooling, at least for now, is is a good option for us because he can still be exposed to groups of kids, but not like every day, all day, eight hours a day, which I feel like would overwhelm him. Because I even noticed at play school, he would come home that afternoon and it would be like meltdown city. Yeah, it was almost like a bit too much for him. So it's just striking that balance, and I don't have it all figured out, but just trying things and seeing what works. Yeah, and nobody has it figured out. I just had a really good conversation for one of these mom chats with my friend yesterday about because somebody sent me a message because right now I'm driving Milo to school. All of a sudden he didn't want to take the bus anymore. And I was like, okay, like I will accommodate you and I can, I have a flexible job. Like, Oh sure. I don't want to push him into something that maybe he's uncomfortable. And so it's like, like you were saying, it's like this balance of, I don't want to coddle him too much and not have him experience certain things. But at the same time, I need to, if I can listen to him, if he like something is bothering him, he's not enjoying something. And so I started to be like one day I went, he does the little after school program for like a half hour after school. And when I went to go pick him up, he was waiting by the door for me. And that just like, made me feel uncomfortable. And I was like, okay. So I keep asking him like, you know how after school you go into the gym and you play with the other kids? Like, do you like doing that? Like, it's hard when they're young because you don't know if they're telling you the truth or what. And he says that he likes it, but I'm like, I don't know. So this week I've been picking him up early because I'm like, I just want to make sure, you know, that he's comfortable. And that's just, it's all about finding balance and Yeah. Yeah. And there's a certain amount, you know, I've listened to so many different podcasts and stuff on this. subject. You know, people, it's funny when you say to people, like you run into someone at a grocery store and they they see your fiber with you and they're like, is it not a school day today? (laughs) You're like, oh, actually we homeschool. Um, And people are like, some people are like, oh, good for you. Other people are like, "Uh, oh, (laughs) and I think it's because like so much of our culture is like wrapped up in in going to school right Mm -hmm. it's like a pretty important fabric of our society um and just there's a certain amount of certainty we think that comes with it um that 
you know, we just know what'll happen. But like the truth is, even when you send your child to school, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. You don't know exactly, like you said, like how they're going to react, if they like it, if they don't like it, um, how things are going. And it's the same with homeschooling, right? Like whatever choice you make, like you're just going to have to do your best and figure out what works for your kid and what doesn't. And some things you thought would be good, they might have trouble with. And some things you thought they would have trouble with, they're great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just like always striking that balance and just like handling the uncertainty, no matter what it looks like. The school thing, like I'll just say it doesn't have to do with young children, but in a similar way, our society has made university like high school. Everyone just goes to university because that's the thing to do. And if you don't go to university after high school, like, hmm, it's a little bit frowned upon. Like, what are you doing with your life? You know, and I'll tell you right now, 75% of the people that are in university should not be there. Correct. And university (laughs) is a business. And that's why it's made out to be this thing that everyone has to go to because it's a business. So that's my piece. (laughs) No, I a hundred percent. And that's, that happens all the time. People are like, well, what about, is he going to go to university? I'm like, again, he's five. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't know, maybe he won't, maybe he he will be a YouTuber. Like you don't know. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm like, university is not the sole indicator of success. Like most people I know, myself included, are not using specifically their degree. Sure. I use the I use my skill set, I gain tools, yeah. my tools and, and to some degree journalism is a pretty practical degree. But most people I know are not specifically using their degree. Nope. For that work. And the thing is, everybody goes and everybody has the same degree. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's wild. Like talk about not using your degree. Like, hello, me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But like, yeah, and so many universities now are ex- are accepting homeschooling students because they recognize homeschooling students often have sort of self-driven learning skills because they've been doing it for way longer. You know, you go to school and you're like you're told how to learn and what to learn and when to learn it. And then you get to university and you're like, wait. I have to do this myself. Mm-hmm. No one's <laughs> going to hold my hand. Yeah. No one's going to hold my hand. And it's a big change. Whereas for homeschooling students, that's not really a big change. Mm-hmm. They're already used to directing their own learning and managing their own time and, and all that. If it's done, you know, in a traditional route, where as they grow, you give them more independence. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So maybe he'll go to university. Maybe he won't. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But it's an option. It's, you know, lots of universities look for homeschooling students nowadays. Yeah. And what's this, like, if he wanted to, let's say he's like, I want to go to school in grade six or something. It's a non-issue. They can just start school or do they have to take testing or something? No testing. They just do it based on age. Now, you obviously at that point would want to speak with a teacher or principal to sort of figure out, you know, what he may need to catch up on or what he's ahead on, etc. Uh, but oftentimes, especially if they're entering sort of in those late elementary, early teen years, like whatever they're behind on, they can catch up so quickly. Yeah. Uh, because at that age, their brain is more developed and, and what have you. Like, unless you've really not done anything at home. But like most homeschooling parents I know are pretty like, okay, we're going to, you know, ensure they have a rel- well-rounded opportunities, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. I'm fascinated by this. And I got to find that girl on TikTok who's like... Okay. I might have like, seen her. I feel like I'm following all of them. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm going to look back. I don't follow that many people on TikTok, so I'm sure I can find her fairly quickly and I'll share it in my stories, like her account, because it was super interesting. Um, yeah. If I find more resources too, I just couldn't think of all of them off the top of my head, but I'll send the ones that, uh, like mm-hmm. that one book. Sure. Um, yeah. It's just because it's like philosophically makes the most sense for more people because practically like every regulation and every jurisdiction you're in is be so different yeah no for sure okay well this was a great conversation thank you oh, for thank you. like submitting that topic i was like oh like homeschool fast like i i i can't do it myself but i admire people that do it and i can see why it is beneficial and yeah see the issues in the school system and whatnot. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that you're so open-minded about things. And I was like, I think she might appreciate this. She's Oh yeah. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Me like the nerd that was in school for like her whole life. (laughs) 
<laughs> I know it's so funny because I was like the nerd in school my whole life. My husband was a bit more like the class clown type. And he's like 100% supportive of homeschooling. He's like, you don't have to convince me about how ridiculous the school system is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's funny. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast and having a mom chat. Thank you. All right. So you're in Ottawa. I lived there for probably like over 10 years. No, maybe 10 years. Um, Have you lived there your whole life? No. So, I mean, I've moved around a bunch. I'm from Alberta. I've moved to live in the States for a while, but I moved to Ottawa for my master's and then just sort of stayed like government job. You know how it goes. So, oh, yeah. So, which, where did you do your master's? At Carleton. Okay, nice. I did my master's at Carleton and then I switched over to Auto U for my PhD. Do you ever go to the Carleton basketball games? Like such a random question. No, I don't, but I have a lot of friends who do. And apparently it's so fun. So fun. Like, I think it's fun. Like basketball is a fun sport to watch, but also Carleton's like the best team in Canada and they have been for so long. I don't know if they still are like... I act like I was just at the school like last year. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I know the players. <laughs> like I haven't been at Carleton since like 2000, what, like 14, 15? But yeah, um, so exciting. I loved going to those basketball games. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on from basketball. So you just told me that you have been on mat leave for... Like the last, well, how old is your child? Yeah. So I actually have two. So okay. my first, my son was born in May, 2020. So like real pandemic baby, like, yep, fully yep. in it. And then went through that mat leave and then went back to work. And it was like, right when stuff was like, yeah, this is going to get lots better. And we're like, let's have another kid. This is great. And then it was like, oh, no, you get two pandemic babies now. Because <laughs> my other, my daughter was born in April this year. So. Uh, okay. So how far apart in age are they? Almost two years, like just under two years. Okay. Nice. And so... I'm struggling. I like to bring my own issues into every podcast episode. So I'm struggling with whether or not to have a second. How did you make that decision? Like, I'm curious, like how people make this decision. Cause having a baby is so difficult. Yeah. And like, I mean, like, I think you can't think about it too much. Otherwise you would never, ever do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it's for us, I know. like, like, I know, like, we pretty much knew that we wanted to. And like, for my, like, maybe it's because he was a pandemic baby. Like, I just felt like I wanted him to have like a companion. I was an only child and I always wanted siblings. So yeah, we kind of wanted that. And then it's just like, it sucks either way. So we're like, let's just get it over with. Like, at least we were also working from home. Like, I think the longer that we would have waited, it would have made it like in some ways easier and some ways harder. He's still very much a baby, which sucks because yeah. then you have like two babies, but at least it's just like, it's like crazy right now. And then once they both start school, we'll be like, Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, you can breathe. <laughs> yeah. And I we know have a lot of friends that had like a closer age gap. So we kind of were like, it sucks, right? Yeah. It sucks. But then it's over. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I like, it's so true. There's, there's ups and downs to both like having a a bigger age gap or having them close together. Cause like my husband and I were talking this morning and he's, he's like, Milo is four. He's finally like independent, like completely out of the baby stage. Yeah. We feel like our lives are kind of not getting back to like what it was before. Cause that'll no. never happen, but you're out of that like baby stage. I don't know how else to put it. And it's kind of not but like, sailing. do you want to go back to the baby stage? Cause I we know. were still in it. So we're like, let's just keep this train rolling more diapers. <laughs> yeah. But like, if you're out of it, you're like kind of getting stuff back. He's in school. And now you're like, do I want to go I know. back there? It, that's what makes it difficult. But I keep having to remind myself like the baby stage in like the span of life, it's just like a blip. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to be so focused on the first like three or four years that will be difficult and forget about the rest of my life. You know, yeah. like it's, 
it's weird. I, I, so that's what I keep trying to tell my husband. Like he's so, (laughs) and like to his point too, he was so involved with Milo. Like he did most of the night times and he was a working physician. So like he probably has PTSD from that time. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, I understand. I, I also feel like with a second, we wouldn't be as anxious Oh, no, that's what I was going to say to like, I mean, she's also just in many ways an easier baby. I don't know if it's because she's a second or just like, you know, they're all different, Mm -hmm. but it's so much easier with the second kid. Do you find like, for example, when Milo would cry when he was a baby, I would get like anxiety and I was just like, there was always this like level of anxiety for everything and wanting to make sure everything was right. And like, I was doing the right thing. And so do you find that kind of eases up with a second? Cause you're like, Oh, like they're crying. Babies cry. It's fine. Like, yeah, exactly. Like you're not, everything doesn't feel as high stakes. Cause you kind of know more. Yeah. And like my husband jokes, he calls it like the benign neglect approach because <laughs> just like when you have a two year old, they take up so much of like your space that there's times like, especially in the nights or like, you know, she would start to fuss and we would like, just like, not get to her in time because we're doing other things and then she would like settle herself for like oh well I guess you learned how to (laughs) self-soothe by accident (laughs) I love it it's so true though oh my god Or like now we're starting solids and it's just sort of like I don't know just like throw some leftovers at like it's just your your anxiety is less because you've already done it yeah you kind of know like what to worry about and you know your approach and all that like yeah and I think you learn what's not a big deal Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So your message to me was about choosing to formula feed. Love this topic. Um, all about it. So what was your experience? Like, was it formula feeding from day one? Did you decide later on? What was your whole experience with that? Yeah. So a lot of it starts with my first, actually with uh, my son who, when he was born, like, again, first kid, you don't really know what you're getting into. And, you know, it was like, like high COVID, like everything was locked down. Like there was not a lot of support. You know, they send you home with this tiny little baby and you just think like, oh yeah, I'll just breastfeed. Like Mm -hmm. that's what you're supposed to do. And nobody really tells you about how, the challenges might be, or if there are challenges, you're just supposed to sort of grin and bear it. Like that's what being a mom is. Right. But like, it was very challenging and, um, he like lost too much weight. This is very normal. Now I know this, (laughs) but like they freak you out, right. They send you home. All of a sudden your baby loses too much weight. That's what they do. But it somehow all like, it feels like it's your fault. Right. Mm -hmm. So I did start breastfeeding him. I went through a big panic. We got this crazy lactation consultant who came to our house, like in full PPE, trying to help me breastfeed. Like it was a lot, but I was like, this is what we have to do. I'm so committed to this idea. And then fast forward a couple of months and you're breastfeeding all the time. Plus you're supposed to be pumping and we were supplementing with formula. And I just reached a point where I was like, this is crazy. Like every, cause when you're worried about their eating, every little thing that goes wrong, like their babies, they cry about things, they have bad nights, they have bad days, but you always feel like it's because of that. Yeah. Cause they're like, Oh, they're hungry. So it's your fault. Right. So you just, you want to do something about that. And I was so stressed all the time. I reached a point where I was just like, I don't think I could do this anymore. And, you know, sat down with my husband and we were like, why are like, let's just switch to formula. Like he was already having it a little bit. And once I let that go and it's like, that was something I could take off my plate. Right. Yes. It was like, I don't have to worry about this. Cause I know exactly how much he ate when it was, it has nothing to do with me. My husband can do it. My mom can do it. Like anybody could do it. And then I just like, it felt like something released Mm -hmm. And I, from that point on, it was like, there was still like challenges, but it was so much easier. Yeah. And like, uh, that was our, that was our experience that time. And now when we came the second time around, I was like, okay, I'm going to try it again. But my attitude is very much like, if I feel like this isn't going well, I will just cut and run. Like, I don't even care. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
And good for you for bringing it up with your husband. I feel like so many women don't like, it's just, this is what I have to do. And they keep doing it. And we had a similar experience with Milo because he was small. They were from the get-go concerned about him gaining weight. Like that's why they induced me so that he could Mm -hmm. come out and get bigger because he stopped growing in my belly or uterus. Um, (laughs) So I was like from day one concerned about him gaining weight. And like you were saying with breastfeeding, you don't know how much they're getting and he was losing weight. They were concerned about jaundice. And it's like, well, how do you get rid of jaundice? You have to feed them. And so they flush like it all out. the time. Yeah. And so it was like, he might have to, if this doesn't get resolved, he might have to stay overnight at the hospital. And of course I'm like, okay, that's the last fucking thing that I want. So I was so stressed about the breastfeeding And finally, my husband just like went and got formula out of the kitchen. And he's like, we're just going to give him formula. And I was like, oh, my God, like, thank you. My knight in shining armor. (laughs) Like, Yeah. And yeah, and that was the thing too. like my husband, like he wanted to help. Like they just feel like we talked about it lately. I think they just feel useless in those early, especially those early days where like it really is all coming from you. And like there's not much they can do to help. They're mostly just helping you. But like. If they want to be involved, this is such a great way to do it. And especially like if people don't end up sticking with it, I wish that people were more open as like hospitals or just everybody to be like in that first month, do what you got to do. Like if you want to exclusively breastfeed, that's totally fine. But like everybody needs a break. You need to recover. Everything's so high stakes in those first couple of weeks the odd bottle is not going to make a difference. Yeah. And that's not the message that's out there, right? Like no. people think, oh, if I start, I'll, I'll like, they'll never come off it. Oh, if I try to do a bottle, they'll get nip- nipple confusion. Like it's not really a thing. Like I know every, every single baby is different and every experience is going to be different. And what works for one person is not going to work for the next. And Like I look at people who exclusively breastfeed till their kids are like two years old. And I'm like, that is freaking amazing. Like I, and like, hopefully they are enjoying it. And it's like a whole amazing experience for everybody involved. I hope so. Because if you don't enjoy it, it's not. Yes. (laughs) And that was the thing. And it was the same thing when I was trying to start solids with Milo, I was like, okay, baby led weaning makes me incredibly anxious. Do I want to feel this anxiety every single time I have to feed my child, which is like a million times a day? No. So I'm not doing it. And it's a lot of people experience that with breastfeeding too. It's like this like dread of like, oh my God, I have to breastfeed and then pumping and all that comes with that. And so it's like, then maybe that's not what's the best option. Like I can't imagine feeling that every single time I have to feed my child. Yeah. Cause it's all the, especially in the start, it's all the times. So yeah. if you, and then you start to dread it and like, it's just terrible. Did you <laughs> so ever even just to take a break sometimes is like that. Like if you want to keep breastfeeding cool, but like, still don't be afraid to like use that as an option. It's not bad. Like, yeah. Did you ever feel like judged by anybody like friends, like, groups i guess your kids were born in covid so you might not have been in much group situation <laughs> not too many but i th- it's not so much judged but like it seems like what it is is like if you are formula mom you have to have like a reason like a traumatic reason right it's like oh did something happen or like was it really bad can you not produce milk and like for my first it was a little bit of like supply and anxiety and all that stuff but for for my daughter it's honestly like it was my choice like it I mean yeah it helps my mental health it helps my rest it helps you know, our family unit function a bit better, but it's not like a scary story. It's just a choice. Like it's not, you don't have to have like a horror story in order to be able to allow to formula feed, right? Uh, like you can just pick it. <laughs> for I remember every time someone would ask, ask if I was breastfeeding, which like, what the fuck? Like, 
like, just like a I'm weird thing to ask. <laughs> yeah. But I always felt like I had to tell them this entire story about like, well, he was going to have jaundice and I was anxious about him. And like, finally, I was like, why the fuck? Like, do I feel like I have to justify why I'm feeding him a certain way? And it's like, yeah. you don't need a reason. Your reason could just be like, I didn't want to. Like, that's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Like, totally. Hmm. Well, my sister had her baby in June, the beginning of June, I think. And I think she started, she was trying to breastfeed. And then eventually she was just like, holy fuck. Like, <laughs> and yeah, it's like, you got to take something off your plate at some point. If it's not going well, or you don't enjoy it, like it's all very different. If you are like one of those people who find it a lovely bonding experience and it's wonderful, like keep doing it. That's, yeah. that's great. But if you're and there struggling, are, like it's, it's a pretty easy thing to take off your plate and it makes a huge difference. There are people that are always like, like ed, you have to, people need to be like educated in it. The, the, the issue is that people are not supported enough. And it's like, I understand that. And I wish that everyone could have like all the education in the world and like all the support in the world, but that is not the world that we live in. So I am just living my life and making decisions based on my world around me. And like, it goes with everything with parenting, like maternity leave, paternity leave, like people don't have support in their everyday life. Like people don't live near family. People don't have close friends nearby. Like it's not the world that we live in. People are expected to have kids and then go back to work when their kid is still waking up five times a night. Like there's always these people who are like, like with the sleep training, we don't live in a world where that many families can not sleep train. Yes. It would be lovely if we were all just like living in this big community and everyone supported (laughs) everyone. And it was like, here, it's your turn to take the kids. Now I'm going to get like eight hours of sleep. Like we just don't have that. So we have to kind of navigate it, navigate parenting and having little kids in the world that we live in. So. Yeah. And we have these options and these resources available to us, you know, so why not use those things? Like, yeah. It's already so hard. You don't need to make your life harder. Like, <laughs> by no. like, you know, like you're already a martyr for being a mom and going through all of that. And like the day-to-day stuff, like you don't also need to have no sleep and, you know, be Struggle. giving up your entire body like 10 times a day for something that you don't enjoy. Like yeah. there's all those things, all the things. And like, um, although I understand like they want to promote breastfeeding, especially the hospitals and the midwives and all that. And it's so good to like, yeah, have those supports, have that education there, but it shouldn't be presented as like all or nothing. And that's how it is being presented to people still. Like mm-hmm. I have mom friends who, you know, were with their baby still in the hospital and they're like, you know, they, they're not gaining weight. Like, can we just give them formulas? And the hospitals don't. You know, and you're just like, there's nothing wrong with it, especially right at the start. Like your supply isn't in yet. The baby is hungry. Like, yeah, nothing bad. (laughs) That is bizarre to me. Like it's and if you have you read Crib Sheet? Yeah. By Emily yeah. Oster. Yeah. Like she has a whole chapter in there that literally dives into all the research and what the research actually says about breastfeeding and like breast milk versus formula. And like, it's not so much of a, like a benefit, like a clear benefit of breast milk that they should be reacting that way, like in the hospitals or Right. It's like, there's obviously benefits and there's obviously great. And I mean, cost can be one of them too. It's not cheap. And we're lucky enough that that's not a factor for us, but it's at, it's at what cost to you. That's the real question. It's like, of course, it's a great thing. Of course, that's the best thing for the baby, but it's also what's good for you and good for your family. And yeah. And it's considering everything else like, okay, okay. Breast milk is great. But now you have an like a a mom with crippling anxiety and zero sleep. So how is that for baby? Like mm-hmm. you have to consider everything when you're making these decisions. And yeah, it's really similar to some of the conversations you've had about sleep training, right? Where yes. you're like, it's what's good for the unit, it's what's good for the family. Like it's the same. We're like, 
yeah, you have to look at it in that way. If you're stressed and tired and anxious about every single feed, yeah, you're not going to be like an engaged parent and you're not going to be the best mom either. And it also takes away from your experience of, like I always say, like the baby stage, like let's say zero to one, one year old is so like short. And it's like, how do you as a mom want to experience that? Yeah. Like you want to be able to enjoy that time as a mom, like learning to get to like getting to know your baby and like, so yeah, these major things that cause like such stress and anxiety and, you know, lack of sleep and just being exhausted. I don't know. Like, it's not worth it. Yeah. No. And it's okay to just be like, that's hard. I don't want to do that. You can choose an easier way and that's totally fine. Like you're not, you're not bad for doing that. Yeah, totally. Okay. This was a great conversation. I'm, I love this topic. I could talk about it forever. Oh my God. Me too. Yeah. (laughs) Even though Milo's four and like, this has not been my experience in a long time. It's so important to talk about. Um, what's the rest of your day look like? So you're on mat leave right now. Yeah. So my mom's actually upstairs. Cause I like was so excited. I was like, the baby's going to wake up. I know it. So I was like, mom, can you come over? So oh, see, I love I don't know. that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I don't know. We'll probably like should just chill. We'll do something for lunch. It's really nice out. So we maybe we'll go I walk know. somewhere. Yeah. I need to get outside and go for a walk. Like I sit in this office all day and it's, it's rare that it's this weather. At, I know. Like, and what is November it? November? Is so, it's going to be so dark later. Like, you need to go now. Because I know. <laughs> like, I, soon at like four o'clock, it's going to be dark. So, I know. at least here. <laughs> I don't know if Toronto's as bad. Um, I don't think so, but it does get dark early now. Like, f- like maybe like six. But I remember going to school in Ottawa and I would have a class that ended at 5 p.m. And walking back to my car, it was like like pitch pitch black. Like you would think it was the middle of the night. And I was like, this is depressing. (laughs) Well, yeah, because I guess next is it next weekend or this weekend is daylight savings. So then it's like, yeah, all bets are off. It's going to be dark at like 430. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, it was lovely to talk to you. Yeah. So good to talk to you. I feel like I know you so well. (laughs) Oh, I know. I feel like that too. Like I, I talk to people and I'm just like, Hey, like I know you, you know me. Hi.